archaeology of the Jews farm area. Ian, take it away. Hi, Ian, Nigel here. I think uh, we're going to see if we can give you control um, of the system. If you can ask for control from me or I can move slides for you. Good to go, Ian. Have we got your volume on, sir? Okay, folks, we're just going to do How's a... that. Is that on? That's perfect. Thank you, Brilliant. Ian. No problem. Oh, Thanks very much. It's <laughs> always one. <laughs> yep. so, thank you, you Nigel. Um, afternoon, everybody. So I'm Ian Williamson, and for the past five years, I've been working with Fusion Joint Venture to deliver um, part of the programme of archaeological works that John's just been describing for you there. Um, today, I'm just going to talk about the southernmost area of our um, sort of 100 kilometre route section. So uh, that seems to be stuck. That's okay. We'll start again here. Let me uh, sure. just request again. It could be because I needed to mute myself. So no problem. Well, let's just request that. again. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So hopefully we'll move on to the uh, the next one. There we go. Excellent. So this is the southernmost of our sites um, at the very start of our route section. This is, um, we call it Jews Farm, but it actually covers a 30 hectare area. So we're located just on the eastern side of the Colne Valley and just northwest of London, about three kilometers north of Uxbridge. Yeah, so just to the north of the site, which you can see on the right there, we've got South Harefield. Um, Harville Road forms the eastern boundary of the site with the Chilton Railway to the south and the open um, former quarry gravel workings which is now Harefield number two lake to the west. Um, topographically the site is dominated um, obviously by the the Colne Valley to the west and then by the watercourse which is the Newsgreen Green Bourne which runs through um, through the southern half of the site um, and we've also got Jews Lane which is bisects with uh, the former Jews farm actually highlighted in yellow there as well. So this site will be the launch point for the Colne Valley viaduct. Um, so not only have you got the viaduct starting and being constructed from here, but you've also got landscape earthworks, flood alleviation works, and a number of other associated construction activities, including the construction of three new habitat sites. Um, just to um, I can't, yeah, there we go, move back up one. <laughs> Let's try that again. I don't know why it's doing that. Anyway, it seems to be flicking about. I'll leave it there for a minute. So in terms of underlying geology, um, the site is actually on a solid geology of the Lammoth Group deposits with New Haven and Seaford chalk deposits actually running through the Colne Valley itself. Um, no superficial deposits were recorded overlying the Lambeth Group, although just on the western edge of the site, we did pick up Shepparton gravels um, and alluvial sequences infilling the Colne Valley itself. So the site is located within the um, Colne Valley archaeological priority zone. So it's got an acknowledged, you know, as an area, it's got an acknowledged um, potential for prehistoric supplement activity and Mesolithic flint working site and several possible Bronze Age uh, ring gullies uh, were recorded just to the west during um, the mineral extraction works in the 1960s. In the area of Jews Farm itself, um, the, the former farm within the site on the western side of the site, um, a number of flint artifacts were found in association with um, organic deposits. So given the, um, the potential of the site and the strategy, which we we're following as part of the HS2 project, we started um, about five years ago now with geophysical survey. And you can see the grayscale on the left there. And on the right, we've got the interpretation overlaid on uh, some of the LIDAR data that John just mentioned in the previous talk. Um, 
the results weren't great, I'll be honest. Um, primarily, we can see evidence for 20th century quarrying within the site, certainly in the northern part of the site and to the east of the area, which we went, then went and evaluated further. Um, there's variation in the geology showing up, modern disturbance, particularly along the line of Jews Lane um, with modern services and utilities going through there. And then more modern agricultural activity and no significant archaeological anomalies within the site. But geophysical survey isn't proof positive that there's no archaeology there, especially not for more ephemeral remains from the early prehistoric period, as Emma has already alluded to. Um, so the next phase of work we undertook with uh, Mola Headland archaeology was trial trench evaluation. Um, CSJV, another of HS2's contractors, had um, undertaken nine trenches across the site uh, before we started works. This was to evaluate a proposed line, a possible line of a high pressure gas main diversion. Um, we then undertook uh, 88 trenches across um, the 30 hectare area of the site, um, primarily you know, to confirm the presence or absence of archaeological remains and artifacts. And as John mentioned, each of the trenches did have three test pit locations along its length where we sieved the soil so that we could identify the density and distribution of possible early prehistoric and later artifacts within the plough zone. Um, I have to say, north of Jews Lane, much of the trenching was negative, there's very little archaeology found, although the test pitting did produce some you know, reasonably reasonable small, small assemblage of um, Mesolithic and Neolithic flint work. The main kind of results were south of Jews Lane, uh, within the valley of the New Year's Greenbourne, as you might expect, where we did get much more positive results. I won't go into these results in detail because we'll just look at a few of the sites um, individually. It's just a quick example of the types of trench we were digging. I'm sure everyone's familiar with these. So we had these larger, deeper ones uh, on the left there to investigate the alluvial sequences of the New Year's Greenbourne floodplain. And that's a fairly typical example of the trenches we, found, we had um, on the right there. So very thin kind of plough soil directly overlying Lambeth Group deposits. So bringing all the evidence together from the trial trenching and you know, the other sources, we identified a number of areas that we wanted to undertake further work, um, primarily to you know, mitigate the impact of construction. Um, and there's four of these that I'm going to go on to talk about. So if we start north to south, um, we've got C155, which was a possible focus of late prehistoric and Romano British activity to the north of Jews Lane. Um, in the centre of the site, we've got C146, which is a possible late Mesolithic, early Neolithic, um, and some Bronze Age activity with, again, evidence from Romano British occupation. Um, just to the south of that, the smallest area was quite a targeted and confined little strip we did um, where we found an Iron Age ring gully, some pits within the New Year's Greenbourne floodplain. And the first one I want to talk about is C149, which uh, down in the southwest corner of the site, which is a, a late Mesolithic, early Neolithic flint scatter and associated features. So we'll move on to that. So Trench 84 was originally planned as um, a standard 50 by 4 trial trench, um, but when it was opened up, we found a number of pits uh, and about 240 worked flints on the surface of the trench. Um, so these were directly beneath the plough soil, overlying the Lambeth group. Um, so the trench was extended to the northwest and the southeast to try and determine the extent of this possible flint scatter. Um, we did extend it out. As I say, uh, we ended up finding uh, a number of features, a couple of gullies, some pits and tree throws, at least two um, cooking pits, which had a, a number of stake holes uh, just alongside it, uh, which may have formed a windbreak or, or structure, um, and a scatter of late Mesolithic to early Neolithic flint. So this is you know, 7,000 to 3,300 BC. Um, in total, we had uh, 1,405 work flints from the surface of the trench, providing a representative sample uh, of the flint scatter. We also undertook a number of test pits along the length of the trench. 
um, as you can see here on screen, what they confirmed um, was that most of the flints were actually lying within the surface of the underlying Lambeth group deposits. Um, and rather than being in situ, they had actually started to sink and were vertically displaced. And this is probably due to um, sort of bioturbation, probably rooting or worm action, because we didn't have any evidence of deep ploughing. So it's probably a natural process where the flints are sinking down into the soft sands of the Lambeth group. Um, there were a number of contemporary cut features which did contain um, late Mesolithic and early Neolithic flint work. Um, so there was a contrast within the trench between um, the formation of the Lambeth group. So we've got these Upnor sands, which you can see in the photos there, but we also had a much um, stiffer Reading, you know, some clay from the Reading group, which was sitting on top of these. And it was within that, the Reading group or the Reading formation that um, we had the cut features surviving, where we do wonder whether at least some of these flints were within uh, possible features that we couldn't see anymore because bioturbation and um, weathering of the of the Lambeth group had just basically made those features disappear over time. And it zoomed on a bit there. Um, so here's some of the, just a, a small number of the flints that came out of this trench. Um, you could talk uh, have a, an individual talk about the flint on its own. Um, but what was clear from what we found, and I think Emma was alluding to it earlier, is that the assemblage is actually dominated by debitage and waste flakes from the primary processing of raw flint into usable cores from which blades and flakes could be uh, struck. Um, about 87% of this assemblage was actually waste flakes and micro debitage. There were 36 cores and core fragments, which the majority came from um, flint cobbles, river flint, um, with it, some of them had a, you know, only a few blades taken off them which had been detached before the flint was discarded, uh, probably because it was quite poor quality material. So there was a, a smaller component of blades and tools, and you can see a few of those on screen. So we've got um, a few blades, we've got an end scraper, there's an awl, and a, a fragment of core there as well. And the anomaly, um, was an early Bronze Age tanged and barbed arrowhead, which was found in one of the test pits. Um, so, as Emma has already said, the composition of the flint suggests that we've got intermittent and probably seasonal visits to this location over several thousand years. Um, and the reason is to collect and undertake the primary processing of natural flint cobbles uh, into prepared cores. Um, those would obviously then be taken wherever they were needed and tools produced off site. Um, the possible cooking pits and associated features do suggest that uh, whoever was undertaking that, that activity was obviously staying in the area on a temporary camp uh, for some time. Now this site is actually one of the few opportunities we've got where we can preserve the remains in situ. So we didn't move on as Emma had showed earlier with the other site. Um, to full excavation. This is actually within what's going to be a new habitat mitigation area, so a new habitat created. So we've got the opportunity to preserve and manage this, uh, this assemblage of flint, this site, um, and save it from any construction impact, which is one of the core kind of guiding principles within the herds um, strategy. So to move on to the next site, to south of Jews Lane. So this is area uh, 146, which where again, we, um, we found late Mesolithic and early Neolithic activity. Um, so it's about 1.2 hectares in size, and it was targeted on a number of trenches. Um, trench seven, which has recorded a layer of burnt material, including burnt flint and seven stake holes, um, and a number of late Mesolithic and early Neolithic flints. And then trenches, eight and 106, which have recorded a pair of ditches, um, continuing through both trenches and a couple of extra pits, um, all of which contain late Mesolithic and Neolithic flint work. Before we undertook uh, mechanical excavation, we did a grid of test pits. So the trial trenching uh, and sampling of the topsoil had found very little, um, very little in terms of artifact material artifactual material in the plough soil, but on the southern half of the site, we had a subsoil from which we were getting um, 
flint you know, flint work. Um, so we undertook an array of test pits to test that. We didn't find any evidence for flint scatters within that area, although it did provide us a useful guide to the machine excavation of the site. So once we'd stripped it, we found that we had not only uh, late Mesolithic and early Neolithic remains, but we also had um, multi-period remains within the site. So we can see there we've got the late Mesolithic and Neolithic finds, oh sorry, features in orange. Um, and they seem to, you know, they primarily represent small hollows um, within the surface of the Lambeth group, which um, contained a sort of preserved saw deposit, which, which obviously contained quite a bit of flint work, um, and also a number of pits, which seem to just form a band alongside the Nears Greenbourne, which flows to the south of the site. Um, one feature of note is that horseshoe shape on the eastern side of the area, just on the right of the image there. Now this contained 206 um, struck flints, mainly waste flakes again, a few blades, um, possibly taken during the reduction of flint core. Uh, there were several primary flakes present together with an end scraper and a late Mesolithic microlith. So we seem to have um, evidence here for, again, temporary, seasonal perhaps, um, occupation along the edge of the New Year's Green Bourne. The next phase of activity uh, is represented by uh, two burnt mounds and a series of uh, just a, a small number of pits, uh, again on the edge of the New Year's Green Bourne. Now, the first of the burnt mounds, um, just in the kind of center left where we've got the star marking it there, um, it was sub oval in shape. It was about uh, seven meters by five and a half meters. And it wasn't really very well preserved. It just survived as a, a thin um, layer of dark gray silt with frequent charcoal and burnt flint inclusions um, from which some late Bronze Age, early Iron Age pottery and small fragments of door were recovered. Um, we also did a radiocarbon sample uh, to date the charcoal, which came back with a date of um, 1442 to 1285 BC. So middle Bronze Age in date by radiocarbon, but the pottery perhaps suggesting it was uh, slightly later. Um, excavation of the mound revealed a further five stake holes, a post hole and a small pit from which 34 sherds of um, post several rimbury pottery were recovered. So we've got possible evidence there for a temporary structure associated with the mound itself. Um, So these are a couple of photos of the second burnt mound. This is better preserved down in the southeast corner of the site. Um, gridded excavation of the material revealed that there were three distinct layers, so possibly three episodes that the, the mound was in use. Um, this one measured nine by six meters. And again, a lot of charcoal and burnt flint, along with 17 sherds of post devil rimbury pottery. So we're talking about 1,000 to 800 BC in terms of date on the pottery. Um, the sort of purpose of burnt mounds is obviously quite debated, um, although it's widely assumed that they are related to the cooking or boiling of water using heated stones, although there is an argument and possibly on this site you could make that with the stake holes that we found under the first burnt mound that there may be some sort of um, sauna bathing or sweat lodge type activity you know, taking place. Um, so whatever the interpretation, we've got clear evidence for late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, um, temporary settlement alongside the Nears Green Bourne on this site. And here we should have just a couple of examples of on the left there, some of the flint work that was recovered from the site and on the right, the um, sherds of the flint tempered um, post devil rimbury ware. Okay, so moving on. Final phase on this site was some late Iron Age, early Roman um, activity. So the earliest of which was a late Iron Age a pair of um, coaxial ditches, which you can just see in the top of the top of the image there in red, which were cut by two later um, ditches, which 
run right the way down the site and enclose an area of pitting activity on the left there. Um, all of the pottery that came out of the features dates from first century BC to first century AD. And we can see we've got some lava quern there, um, which is an import from sort of the Eiffel region. And then we've got some uh, slag down in the bottom corner, which is a tells us that there's grain processing and metalworking going on. I mean, the activity we've got on this site seems to be peripheral activity on the edge of a settlement, probably to the east of our site and possibly within the area affected by um, 20th century quarrying activity. So just peripheral activity rather than the yeah, full settlement. Just very quickly, want to look at the last two sites that I mentioned earlier. So this is C147 within the floodplain of the New Year's Green Bourne, where trial trenching had picked up part of uh, an Iron Age ring ditch. Um, we were constrained when we undertook the excavation by um, a high pressure gas main, which was just to the north. So we managed to get the full um, circuit of the ring gully um, from which we actually got uh, handmade um, pottery from a number of the slots and from the associated pits. We also had a radiocarbon date, um, which came back as 206 to 50 BC. So firmly within the, the middle Iron Age or possibly the, the late Iron Age there. Um, the segmented nature of this possibly suggests that it's not actually a roundhouse, that it could be a small stock enclosure, possibly seasonal grazing, uh, of the water meadows or you know the grasslands, wet grasslands alongside the, the New Year's Green Bourne, although the post those on, on the eastern side of the Ring Gully do suggest that there may have been some form of timber structure. Um, and then, as you can see, there wasn't very much else within this area, just a couple of pits on the southern side, which dated to the Roman period. And then the final site, right up at the north end, uh, where trial trenching picked up a couple of um, pits which had uh, late Bronze Age pottery within them. Um, we opened up a small area. Um, the remains here were quite truncated as you can see by the photo in the bottom right corner there and they did become more truncated as you moved eastwards towards the area which had been affected by uh, 20th century quarrying activity. The earliest feature was a pit from which two um, Neolithic or early Bronze Age blades were recovered just showing some very limited evidence of occupation activity along the terrace edge of the River Colne during that period. Um, there were several late Bronze Age, early Iron Age uh, pits from which again, post several Rimbury pottery coming out of and extending the extent of uh, late Bronze Age, early Iron Age activity along the terrace edge of the Colne Valley there. Um, the main kind of phase was this open-sided um, enclosure uh, of the Roman period uh, late Iron Age, early Roman period, um, and a few pits. There was a, a flanking ditch along the southern side there. So again, we're getting peripheral activity um, on the edge of settlement rather than the actual focus of settlement itself. Um, what is interesting on, in these ditches though, is that we did recover some late um, Roman pottery ware so, and fabric. So we had um, Alice Holt Farnham ware, Oxford colour coats and Porchester ware. So perhaps we're seeing a bit of longevity to the, the Roman settlement, which we weren't seeing further to the south. Um, and that covers what I wanted to talk about today. That's an overview of the archaeology of um, Juice Farm area. And if there are any questions, I'll happily answer them now. That's fantastic.